One week after Aaron Bushnell set himself on fire in an extreme act of protest for Palestine, the world has been awestruck by his galvanizing act of courage, with his last words being free Palestine. Now, across the world, including in Yemen and in Gaza, Aaron Bushnell is being memorialized as a martyr for Palestine as Israel continues its genocide in Gaza that has left over 30,000 people dead. His protest was not only moving, but it stood in stark contrast to the empty rhetoric given by so-called liberal politicians who are doing very little to stop Israel from continuing its war on civilians. Aaron Bushnell was not only horrified by Israel's actions, but by his own Air Force. We recently learned that he had classified information about U.S. Air Force actions aiding Israel in bombing Gaza, and he used his privilege to not be complicit in this war crime. But who exactly was Aaron Bushnell, and how was his extreme act of protest actually in line with a long history of active military service members who had a conscious awakening during their service, including in the Vietnam War era and other U.S. wars? To talk more about this, we are joined by Mike Preisner. He's a former Iraq War veteran turned anti-war activist and organizer. He's also a producer and journalist with The Empire Files. Mike, thank you so much for joining me today. Happy to be here. Mike, you are a former Iraq War veteran who has friends and colleagues who actually knew Aaron Bushnell uh, personally. Can you tell us who is Aaron Bushnell and the story of how he was galvanized for Palestine while enlisted in the Air Force? Sure. Well, I've talked to several people who both uh, knew Bushnell in the Air Force uh, and who knew him as an activist starting in about really about 2021, uh, became active in the movement in uh, San Antonio. And <clears throat> by all accounts, uh, Aaron Bushnell was very much loved, uh, a genuine person, um, you know, somebody who, of course, the media is describing them as mentally unstable or extreme and things like that. You know, nobody, nobody who knew him has any of those things to report. And, you know, uh, Aaron Bushnell not only is, is part of a tradition of active duty service members who rebel in some form or another, but specifically this act of self-immolation, which is being treated by the media as, you know, of course, it is an extreme act, um, but only the acts of, of someone who is a crazy person. There were about a dozen Americans who self-immolated in protest of the Vietnam War here in the United States. Um, perhaps more Americans self-emulated in protest of, of the Vietnam War uh, than did Buddhist monks in Vietnam, which of course there's the iconic images of and are kind of treated as, you know, the ones who use self-emulation as, as a protest during the Vietnam War. You know, many, uh, many Americans did the same thing during Vietnam. In fact, the emulation, uh, self-emulation of an American, which Daniel Ellsberg uh, saw through his window, was part of what he says was his impetus to release the Pentagon Papers. And so not only is, is there this history of self-immolation by very genuine, deep thinking people who are, are so, opposed, uh, so opposed to war and to killing by, the, by their government that they take this, uh, ult this extreme act, this ultimate sacrifice, but it has also been the impetus for change uh, from people like Daniel Ellsberg others said like a domino effect of others rebelling, but also became galvanizing moments for the movement. And so Aaron Bushnell already, not just being a hero across, you know, the Arab and Muslim world, you know, where his pictures are hanging all over Yemen and Iraq and Palestine. But we saw the responses across the country. It did have the impact of pushing more people, more activists in the United States to increase their determination and dedication to the struggle for Palestine. Um, we saw that with vigils across the country, mass protests on that uh, International Day of Action, photos of Aaron Bushnell were everywhere. And so not only is he in a long line of rebellious soldiers, people who use self-immolation to protest war, but uh, those acts actually having major impacts on the movement and the struggle for justice. And I actually want to expand on your point about media framing his protest as a mental health issue. If you go search Aaron Bushnell's name right now, we come up with headlines and articles within corporate media framing his protest as a mental health issue. Social media platforms like YouTube even have suicide hotline messages under videos um, discussing Aaron Bushnell. 
Given the media's framing of his protest of self-immolation as a mental health issue and the presence of these suicide hotline messages on platforms discussing him, how do you view the portrayal of his actions in the mainstream media and on social media? I mean, do you think there is a deliberate effort here to divert attention away from the political nature of his protest? Sure. Yeah. I mean, this, you know, suicide is uh, a very different thing. Um, you know, the of course, that that's going to be the media attempt. Um, you know, I was very proud that in our reporting on Aaron Bushnell, instead of including the suicide hotline at the end of the piece, we included the GI rights hotline, which is information for service members like Aaron Bushnell. If you're feeling like he was feeling that you can get out of the military and you can use various uh, rights to fight against it and get yourself out of it. Um, I think what they don't want to address is what a Pentagon spokesperson was asked by a reporter in the wake of uh, Aaron Bushnell's death, is that is Aaron Bushnell really just the tip of the iceberg? Uh, is it indicative of wider discontent within the active duty military against their government's handling of the Gaza genocide? And that we know is the real story here. Yes, Aaron Bushnell's act was extreme, but when you have a large uh, amount of discontent around, uh, amidst a large sector of the population, there are going to be sectors of that that act more extreme. Aaron Bushnell is a representation of that. But for every one Aaron Bushnell, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of people in uniform who are just as disgusted with the Gaza genocide as Aaron Bushnell was. Um, and so, and that that I know very well. I mean, I have talked to many, many, many active duty service members, uh, uh, service members in the reserves and in the National Guard who are not just horrified by the Gaza genocide, but who are taking part in all of the protests, uh, who are traveling from their bases to the national marches in Washington, D.C., or, or who are, um, you know, in the reserves or National Guard, but attending all of the local protests in their cities. And, you know, this, of course, has happened through every U.S. war or U.S. backed war. But right now, for sure, there are many, many more uh, people in the military who had the same feelings as Aaron Bushnell about uh, their disgust with the Gaza genocide, um, but also that are are taking action as well and who have been in the streets and who have been part of this composition, this kind of broad fabric of, of all different types of people from all walks of life who are taking to the streets for Palestine. I know for a fact that not just veterans like myself, but people in the active duty like Aaron Bushnell was are part of those demonstrations as well. I'm really glad you mentioned that because during the Vietnam War era, we actually saw active duty soldiers leading anti-war protests and rejecting their medals because they didn't want to be complicit in that war in which the Vietnam War was referred to as a genocide at that time. But not only did they protest, but they actually organized the protest. Talk to me about the military culture back then and why more military personnel were willing to make those sacrifices. What is the history of military service members and anti-war activism? Sure. Well, of course, the Vietnam War is the greatest example because it was active duty service members and recently returned Vietnam vets who were not just a part of the struggle, but in many ways leading the anti-war struggle and carrying out some of the most dramatic actions, um, exposing the war crimes and so forth and organizing within the military. I mean, there was large scale rebellion and mutiny within the military during the Vietnam War. You know, entire units just started refusing to fight, um, even those who were in, in Vietnam, not just re refusing orders to deploy. Um, so that's a very important history. I encourage everyone to explore. There's so much there. But it's not just the history of the Vietnam War. Every single war in American history since the United States became an overseas territorial empire, you have instances of rebellion and mutinies uh, against those things. From the, you know, from going to the Philippines in 1899, you had black soldiers who not just rebelled against the war and refused to fight, but who actually fled to join the Philippine resistance against the United States Army. Um, and many more were executed and hanged for trying to do so. So that's 125 years ago. And in every single U.S. war since, you have very strong examples of anti-war soldiers who rebel all the way through the modern era. The Gulf War, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan had large numbers of U.S. service members who refused to go or who went and then became very dedicated fighters against the war. And then in your, you know, two justifiable wars that the United States have fought in the, uh, the Civil War among the Union Army and in World War II uh, against fascist Germany, um, you have 
instances of soldiers still rebelling and, and engaging in mutiny against racism within the military. So in the Civil War in the Un Union Army, you had many instances of black soldiers rising up, uh, attacking and, and t uh, white officers and, and freeing their comrades who were, who were falsely held in prison or being punished. Um, and then in World War II, you have a rich history of, uh, of not just black soldiers, but all types of soldiers engaging in mutinies against racism and for better conditions. And so I think, you know, while Aaron Bushnell may seem like a fringe outlier, a uh, rebellion by soldiers in the act of duty during a time of war is actually part of the history of every single conflict that the United States has been in. To varying degrees, sometimes it's smaller, sometimes it's bigger, but anytime the U.S. is engaging uh, in killing, that these types of things are going to happen. And so, you know, that's very important history for activists to know, because, you know, as we are organizing different parts of society to create the greatest and biggest, most effective united front we can, we have to acknowledge that veterans and, of course, people in the military are very much a part of that. And because of soldiers' position within the military, of course, uh, have much greater potential for causing problems for Washington. I mean, Aaron Bushnell, the fact that he was an active duty service member is why it is so bad for Washington. Uh, if Aaron Bushnell was was someone who had just been discharged, who had never been in the military at all, it'd be easier for Washington to blow off. But the fact that it was someone in uniform on the active duty uh, was a, is a very big political problem for Washington. And uh, more and more service members who may be wanting to take action, when active duty people or people in the reserves or National Guard do take acts of protest against what's happening, it carries so much weight because, you know, they're supposed to be, be the people that are completely in line with what the Pentagon is doing. And when you're seeing rebellion from within that, you know, for example, there was just this uh, open letter published that came from the active duty military condemning uh, the Gaza genocide. You know, that causes real problems for Washington because those are those are supposed to be your guys, you know. So what did Aaron know about the U.S. Air Force aiding Israel in Gaza? What was he trying to draw attention to? Well, I think there's a lot that we already do know, right? I mean, that the Air Force is running weapons and helping with logistics for the Israeli war machine. And I, so I think just based on what is known uh, to the media uh, and to people in the military, I mean, that's enough. I mean, even though, you know, Aaron Bushnell didn't have a direct role, he knew that, you know, facilitating the functioning of the Air Force was in some way you know, facilitating the export of these weapons and the, the logistical support uh, that was happening. And so I think, you know, one of the things and, and of, of course, Aaron Bushnell's statement in, in doing this that he was trying to draw attention to was the just the extreme barbarism of it. And this is what uh, the U.S. government has tried to make normal and acceptable. And it shouldn't it shouldn't be. Um, and Aaron Bushnell also used the phrase ruling class. I mean, Aaron Bushnell was not just part of this history of soldiers who become anti-war or become politicized, but someone who had become class conscious. And by identifying the ruling class uh, as the perpetrators of this was identifying that we live in a class society with a ruling class that is very small, that has all the money, that makes all, of the, all the decisions, who are the ones, the small group of people who actually gain from the Gaza genocide, uh, whereas the rest of us in, in the other class, the working class, are the ones who not only pay from it, but suffer from it and have so much in common with those in Palestine who are being killed uh, when we don't have anything in common with people who are in the ruling class. And so I felt, you know, one of the parts of his statements that is not reported enough is is Aaron Bushnell's class consciousness and his identification of the enemy, the ruling class, not just Biden or not just a particular administration, not just Netanyahu, um, but this this rulers of our society and the, the, the class that they represent. Well, I want to talk more about your personal awakening. What was the catalyst in your journey as someone who was active duty in the Iraq war that moved you to denounce the military and have you faced any significant blowback or challenges from the military establishment or even fellow veterans? Sure. Well, I think, you know, one of the reasons that uh, Aaron Bushnell's death has hit the anti-war veterans community particularly hard, you know, been talking to, to so many of my friends and colleagues who are in this world. And, you know, it was it was very tough for everyone because we can all identify uh, very much and relate to Aaron Bushnell, that feeling of. Uh, and this speaks to my own my own awakening, I guess you could call it. You know, so many people join the military with a 
an idea of what it's going to be like and what it means and what you're going to be doing and all of that, because we're kind of really sold a fantasy by recruiters, by mass media, just by American culture in general. I mean, it's the glorification of the military and the worship of the military. You know, it's like it's like a, a major religion in the United States. Uh, but, you know, it, it doesn't take much for people to realize it's completely contradictory to what you're actually doing. And, you know, there's no greater example in my generation than the Iraq war, which was sold to us as going and freeing and helping the Iraqi people and to find these weapons of mass destruction when, you know, all of that was clearly, uh, clearly a lie. And, you know, helping the Iraqi people was probably the biggest, a bigger lie than finding these weapons of mass destruction, which was completely fake, of course. Um, and so, you know, I, I was just one uh, Iraq veteran who went through this kind of transformation. You know, um, you know that clip uh, where I'm speaking uh, at the White House. Uh, I, there's, you know, a dozen or more Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, and even active duty people who are standing right there with me. Um, and this is in 2010. This is, you know, uh, just a time where there wasn't a ton of anti-war activism, and still at that time there was that many people who had come to D.C. to take part in a civil disobedience action where everyone is getting arrested um, during the height of the Iraq War. It's like, you know, I was just one of thousands of active duty service members of Iraq veterans who were rebelling against the war, um, and for everyone, every thousand who. Uh, became activists like I did and went to demonstrations and spoke out and things like that, uh, there were thousands more who nobody ever saw or heard of, or people that just filed as conscientious objectors who never became activists, but who refused to deploy um, and rebelled in, in their own ways. And so, yeah, I mean, that's just, it's uh, it's a rich tradition. And I think that, you know, this this idea of, of joining and thinking you're joining something good and just and honorable, and then seeing what you're really part of um, changes a lot of people. And in terms of backlash from the military, no, uh, that I haven't, I haven't gotten that yet. And, and I don't expect to, but others have, and especially those who are, who are on the active duty. Um, but I think it's important for those on active duty to understand that you actually do have quite a lot of rights to take part in political protests and actions. And, um, you know, there's always the GI rights hotline as a resource, if you want to know, but it is, perfectly within the bounds of the law, military law, for any active duty person to go to these demonstrations for Palestine uh, and take part in them. And, and of course, that's what everyone should do. I'm actually going to play a viral clip of you denouncing the military, the one that you mentioned from 2010 in front of the White House. Let's take a look. To all those serving in the Army, in the Marines, in the Air Force, in the Navy, you have the absolute right to refuse to take part in these criminal wars, and that's the right that all of you should exercise. We've been to Iraq, we've been to Afghanistan, and we know what these wars are really about. We join the military, and they tell us that our enemies are poor people in caves in Afghanistan, or poor people in the deserts of Iraq, but we've been to those countries, and we know that our enemies are not other poor people abroad. Our enemies are the people that laid us off from our jobs, that denied us health care, that make it impossible to get an education. Our enemies are not in the poorest countries on the planet, but right here in the richest one. They're not going to end the wars, because it's not our government. It's their government. It's the government of the rich. It's the government of Wall Street, of the oil giants, of the defense contractors. It's their government, and the only language that they understand is shutting down business as usual. And that's what we're doing here today. And we're going to continue to do until these wars are over. So as we heard you in this clip, you are calling on active military members to refuse to serve. Considering the ongoing conflicts and geopolitical dynamics, um, what is your opinion, uh, the role of military personnel in challenging or questioning the decisions made by their superiors, especially when it comes to interventions that may have severe humanitarian consequences? Sure. Well, you know, that speech was the Iraq war was still going on and the Afghanistan war was really just ramping up. And so, you know, one of the reasons we were making the case for service members to refuse to deploy is that, you know, these were these are wars that Washington had lost. They had brought us into on false pretenses. And when the war went badly, when the war blew up in their faces and then there was just mounting, mounting civilian casualties and American casualties, they just continued to lie and continued to send more and more people to kill and die. And so there were so many service members who were faced with this question, should I go 
and be a part of killing people that I have no reason to kill? Or should I be going and walking around aimlessly uh, in a field lined with IEDs to get my legs blown off or be killed because of these rich politicians who aren't even telling us the truth? And so, of course, the answer to that would be absolutely no. And uh, most service members don't know that there's actually quite a lot of avenues to be able to get out of doing things like that. And, you know, why throw your life away for some rich, stupid politician who doesn't care about your life uh, at all? But in terms of it, like in a context like this with Gaza, um, the role that active duty people can play is when there is discontent and rebellion within the U.S. military, it has so much potential uh, for creating a crisis for Washington that makes them have to rein back their policy or change it altogether. You referenced Vietnam earlier, the entire Vietnam War, the, the politicians had to navigate around the fact that there was so much mutiny and rebellion from their soldiers. And so today with Gaza, if there were more uh, types of rebellion from within the military, you know, that would continue to deepen the political crisis that Washington was in and can have a big impact. And then when it comes to starting new wars, for example, when it looked it was looking like the U.S. was going to go to war with Iran under Trump with the assassination of Soleimani, you know, had you had large numbers of soldiers at that time, which I believe would have happened, uh, refused to take part in that war, that would have made it very difficult for Washington to sell the war to the public. And so in, in moments like that, where a new war is starting, the intervention of the active duty can really be decisive in creating enough of a political crisis for Washington that they have to, you know, back off or abandon it altogether. So we're going to play uh, a clip from just about a year or two ago of you disrupting George Bush, who launched that war that you uh, were active duty in. Uh, was round two. And, uh, Mr. Bush, when are you going to apologize for the million Iraqis that are dead because you lied? You lied about weapons of mass destruction. You lied about to 9-11, you lied about Iraq being a threat, you sent me to Iraq, you sent me to Iraq in 2003, my friends are dead, Joshua Castile, you you killed people, you lied, you lied about WMD, a million Iraqis are dead because you lied, my friends are dead because you lied, you need to apologize. So talk to me about the similarities between Western media coverage during the Iraq war versus coverage now during the U.S.-backed Israel war in Gaza. Has anything changed? Sure. Well, of course, um, I think you could make the argument that both in the Iraq war, which lasted many, many years, and what's happening in Gaza, mainstream media, of course, makes an effort to not seem completely one-sided. Of course, they are pretty one-sided. But throughout Iraq and with Gaza, you do have reports on cable news and other mass media outlets like the New York Times and so forth that do cover uh, killing of civilians and war crimes and things like that and critiques of the war in some form or another. But, you know, of course, those are outweighed by the other types of reports that are favorable to the perpetrators of the war, to Israel and the United States. But I think even when you have these kind of breakthroughs, um, like right now, there's, there's you know, coverage on CNN and MSNBC of the, the famine that is looming over Gaza. There's been decent coverage from time to time about different war crimes that Israel committed. Just like during the Iraq war, you could find reports that were good about actions by the US and so forth. But uh, those are few and far between, outweighed by the others. But even among those, there still is kind of this framing of good guys and bad guys. Uh, in the Iraq war, yes, the U.S. did bad things, but ultimately the U.S. were the good guys and they were fighting terrorists. The people that were fighting were terrorist forces. They weren't you know, legitimate and justified resistors. And the same is true in Gaza. I mean, they'll report on, of course, killing of civilians, uh, but these killing of civilians were by the good guys who need to change their tactics. And ultimately, when they're killing people who are armed, you know, that's totally justified. And so in both conflicts, uh, it's, you know, the only the killing of civilians that can be treated with, with some kind of critique. But in Iraq, and likewise in Gaza, the killing of armed people is wrong, too. I mean, these people are defending their homes. They are the ones who have been invaded. They are the ones uh, who are being occupied. And so I think that kind of framing of 
good guys versus bad guys. And you can critique the good guys when they step out of line or, or do something wrong. But ultimately, it's this struggle between good and bad. And we're t they're very much telling you who the good guys are uh, in those situations, which is an upside down reality. I want to piggyback on your point about uh, local resistance. Um, let's talk about the realities on the ground for Palestinian resistance today. Gaza is the world's largest concentration camp, and the local resistance fighting their occupiers have been besieged in the enclave for over a decade. Do you think that they are at an advantage or disadvantage in this war? Sure. Well, you know, I've, of course, watched every single video published by the various resistance forces who are recording them. And I think you can see an incredible amount of heroism and bravery, which is very important to document, and an incredible amount of ingenuity. I mean, their ability to make their own weapons, their own munitions, and to engage in, in a certain type of guerrilla harassment tactics that you know are, are difficult for the IDF in so many ways. Uh, that said, um, they're in an incredibly difficult position. They're at an incredible disadvantage. And you can't really compare it to the resistance in against occupation in Iraq and in Afghanistan. You know, re resistance movements, which essentially defeated U.S. forces and a large number of U.S. forces over many, many years. Um, despite the Gaza resistance's ability to constantly harass and poke in the eye IDF forces. Um, in Iraq, in particular, you had a lot of access to high explosive munitions across the country. So resistance forces were able to get large high explosive munitions that were left over from previous wars and just all in, in arms depots all around Iraq. And they were able to create really impactful IEDs that, you know, would really swallow up a tank um, and then follow up these huge IED attacks with um you know, sophisticated close ambushes and even secondary IEDs that would blow up the response teams that would come to rescue people uh, and to take to pull people out of that of that zone. Uh, similarly, in uh, Afghanistan, you know, you'd had not just access to high explosive munitions, but lots of fertilizer being a, a farming community. And so all of this fertilizer that could be produced and made by farmers could be turned into massive explosives that were able to be used by the resistance forces in Afghanistan. And not only that, but you had uh, supply lines that were open. I mean, resistance forces in Iraq and Afghanistan were able to be resupplied with munitions and Afghanistan in particular with an unlimited flow of fighters and new recruits um, who had just come out of extensive training. You know, they had the ability to be resupplied and you had a lot more, you know, freedom of movement, you know, within these combat zones of resistance fighters. Uh, Gaza resistance doesn't have that same kind of access to explosives, which is one of the big disadvantages they are at. They found ways to be use a lot of ingenuity. You know, there's they're pulling old munitions out of the ocean and repurposing them, you know, from, you know, from decades ago and, and things like that. Uh, but the access to things that could do real major damage, you know, they don't really have. Um, and additionally, you know, of course, the, the generals in the Pentagon will tell you that they could have won the war in Iraq if they just turned it into a parking lot, you know, like Donald Trump likes to say, uh, which, you know, perhaps they could have, you know, if they leveled every building, it's completely surrounded and besieged the country so nothing could get in or out and just leveled every building and just made sure ev laid waste to every single structure and shot every single person they saw, you know, perhaps they could have won uh, in Iraq. That's the strategy that Israel is employing. The United States politically, you know, could not have weathered something like that, especially with the amount of domestic opposition in the United States. Israel not only has the domestic support for doing whatever they want, but that is essentially the tactic they are using. They are laying waste to everything and everybody. And the Gaza resistance more or less is cut off. Um, you know, I it's there's probably not much, if any, uh, supplies and resupplies that can make it in and out of Gaza. Um, and although they are able to sustain and harass and, and inflict casualties on IDF forces, um, you know, we don't know how long that can actually last. I mean, they can last a long time. Obviously, they were prepared to fight um, some some duration of a war from the tunnels and have enough food and water and munitions to be able to do that. But probably not something they can do forever. And uh, I guess I say this not to be demoralizing. Um, you know, this isn't 
this isn't the Israeli occupation of Gaza that happened prior to them being kicked out in 2005. This is this is very different. The amount of armor, the amount of soldiers, the amount of destruction, the amount of killing is so, so extreme that, yes, resistance fighters can last for some amount of time. But can they last forever and cause enough harassment that would ca cause the Israelis to withdraw? Um, that that we don't know. Um, and I think I say this not to be demoralizing, but it, it puts more of an impetus on the movement in the United States uh, and more of an impetus on the legal case at the ICJ and the international community to stop to stop this. I mean, it's we, we can't just wait for Israel to be defeated. I mean, that's not really that's not the way we should be thinking about this. There is a real urgency um, and to support the the resistance in Gaza and the people of Gaza, you know, we all need to be doing everything we can and putting maximum pressure on our government to to have it to have an endpoint for it and, and to pull the plug on it. So to answer your question, big disadvantages, despite the amount of ingenuity and heroism and bravery being shown by resistance fighters there. So it is election season now, but I think with all of these actions taking place, the mask has fallen from the neoliberal establishment and more people are aware now that Democrats support war just like Republicans would. But we're being um, bombarded with messaging to vote for Democrats, to vote for Biden so that we can avoid Trump. What do you think people need to do this election season? Well, you know, I, I'm voting for Claudia de la Cruz, uh, which you can vote for in several states, but not all. I mean, protest votes, of course, are very important. We've seen that through the primary where we just had a, yet another state uh, show a, a very unexpected number of uncommitted votes, which is in protest of Joe Biden, which is putting even more pressure on the Biden administration. I mean, look, the the fact is, is that Biden could stop the genocide. You know, every everybody knows this, um, but but doesn't actually care. And, and you know, there's an article recently in The New Yorker interviews with Biden and other high level, uh, high ranking members of his staff who are basically saying, uh, we don't think Gaza is going to be a big issue in the election. Come November, everyone will have forgotten about it and everyone's going to be focused on saving democracy from Trump. And so they they believe that everyone's going to forget about it. So what what we can do and of course, Biden and, and his entire team they all deserve to be punished. You know, you have people like Ned Price and all these other spokespeople who are going up day in and day out, defending the intentional starvation of infants and of children, even as these these horrific photos are coming out of babies and young children who have starved to death, literally starved to death, wasted away. And they can still go up there and say, Israel has the right to defend itself. This is a form of self-defense by Israel, stopping infant formula from going in and intentionally killing large numbers of infants who cannot consume anything but formula or breast milk, not water, not food, nothing, or they will die. These people who are defending this just horrific, ghoulish policy, they all deserve to be punished. And so Biden should absolutely lose this election and all of these people should be humiliated and, you know, never work again in their lives. And of course, they belong in jail. But, you know, maybe in a perfect world that will happen. But I think that the uh, because Biden has the power to do this, uh, the pressure on this election is uh, very it has a lot of potential to actually cause the U.S. to actually take steps to end to ending this. Uh, I think that already the protest votes of uncommitted have had a big impact. But if that kind of stuff continues, the fact that Biden now has, was disrupted so many times when he was going to do campaign events that they actually have kind of stopped, started cutting them off to the public and having these more restrained, like invite only smaller gatherings, which is hurting his ability to campaign. And even some of those are able to be disrupted. You know, his wife, Jill Biden, was just disrupted at one of these, you know, closed door uh, campaign fundraiser events. And so these things are having a huge impact. I think, of course, the DNC coming up, there should be a big mobilization to uh, shut down the DNC, both from outside and from inside. And I think those those uh, actions have have a lot of power. But I think the more important thing is, you know, election is one day. Uh, the DNC is what, what a weekend or whatever. And what is most important is all of the things that happen that are happening daily and weekly to put pressure on the government to, to end what's happening. The more creative actions, civil disobedience actions, actions that are shutting down cities, 
uh, do so much. And we've seen throughout history that they they actually make a difference in bringing about the end of war. And so, you know, everyone, you know, whatever you do in November, I think every day until November is what is what is most important. And then, you know, it'll have to continue after November as well.